a lot, everyone, and thank you so much, Mr. Rai. I think it uh, sets us well for the discussion today. Um, I will just take a brief moment to um, introduce the esteemed panel, and the profiles need no introduction, but I will do my best. So with no further ado, and in no particular order, let me first um, uh, uh, introduce Mr. Arvind Bali. Uh, he's the current CEO of the Telecom Sector Skills Council, needs no introduction an accomplished business leader with 35 years of expertise in managing various business streams with global, uh, globally respected outcomes. Uh, second of all, we have Mr. Atul Lal. Um, he is the vice chairman and MD at Dixon uh, Technologies and has been associated with company since its inception, a co-founder at that. Uh, he's also responsible for the company's overall business operations and of course has more than 25 years of experience. Um, I again have Mr. Jitendra Singh, we'll call him Jeep for, for today. Uh, he is a CFO at the VVDN Technologies. Uh, prior to joining VVDN, uh, he has had an experience of more than 30 plus years, belies uh, from, uh, from how he is right now, so uh, fantastic experience there. And he's headed various departments such as divisions uh, of finance, internal audit, corporate uh, strategy, and planning. I also have um, Mr. Jaideep, uh, um, I also, let me just first introduce Mr. Bhubnesh Sachdev. Uh, he's a senior vice uh, president, product development with HFCL. And um, uh, he heads the product development division of, of HFCL with 22 years of experience. He has led multiple product lines and has held various leadership positions in um, India and multinational organizations. Uh, and in his current role, Bhuvnesh is responsible for driving new product development efforts in HFCL. Um, I also have Jaideep Redke. Um, he is uh, the head of global supply chain in Pros Technologies. Um, Jaideep uh, uh, has uh, demonstrated success across telecommunication, FMCG, pharmaceuticals, and capital goods industry. And he's also responsible for business in India as well as the global supply chain operations of Pros Technologies. Uh, with that, I think uh, we'll launch straight into the, uh, the session. Uh, we have a good 45 minutes, uh, and I'll request everyone to sort of participate, give their views with respect to the questions coming along. But I think um, from our perspective, uh, India stands at the fulcrum of the 5G launch, and it's important that uh, we understand the ecosystems behind it so that the manufacturing sector is bolstered. Uh, in the last few years, the Atman Nirbhar Bharat mission uh, has found uh, its resonance and reflection in the PLI scheme. And I think uh, uh, that's what we are trying to sort of unravel a little bit in terms of what does it mean for the industry. Um, I think uh, if you will, and you will all agree, I think the global players today are looking at India from cost, both from a cost uh, uh, optimization perspective, there's also a need to sort of find another alternative source as they restructure their supply chains. Now, I would basically open it up to this panel to say, uh, first question, I think because uh, Mr. Honorable Prime Minister's vision with respect to Atmanirbhar Bharat and the uh, PLI scheme, how has the scheme sort of um, uh, given uh, some impetus to the manufacturing per se? And perhaps, I mean, you're sitting right next to me, Atul, may I open this up for you, and especially in the context of the fact that, uh, congratulations, you have, uh, uh, you know, you've uh, just won the agreement with, the, with Google, uh, where you will be doing sub-licensing and contract manufacturing on the, on the TV, the LED TV manufacture uh, on the Android platforms and Google platform, so uh, in your view, how does this entire scheme bodes well for manufacturing? So, uh, thanks very much, uh, Manisha. I think uh, in the opening remarks, uh, Haryomji has uh, very well articulated the positive enthusiasm in the industry. Uh, we feel that the industry is at an inflection point we feel it's some kind of a Y2K movement for electronic manufacturing in India. We are of a firm conviction that electronic goods being sold in India would be manufactured. 
Second, this manufacturing over a period of time would keep on deepening. Third, very shortly is going to be design-led, deepened manufacturing from India. Fourth, it is not only going to be servicing the domestic market, it is going to be servicing the global market. Undoubtedly, uh, it's our inflection point. Now, any industry, globally or in India, in its stages of infancy, requires uh, some kind of government support, some kind of hand-holding. Till the time, it's able to stand on its own feet. And that's what PRI scheme is all about. Undoubtedly, there is a skill set, but we can't be emotional about things. There was definitely a set of disabilities. And those disabilities, at least for a particular tenure of time period, needs to be bridged. And the government very prudently has, has, uh, has rolled out the PLI scheme. I'm seeing this, I mean, we at Dixon are a, a PLI beneficiary of five schemes mobile, IT products, telecom devices, lighting components, air conditioning components. And uh, I can see, you see my global revenues for mobile, which were barely $100 million. This year I'm going to touch $500 million. Next year I'm going to touch a billion dollars. And this is thanks to PLI. But then this is not it. You see, along with the PLI schemes comes a huge sense of commitment on deliverables as, as entrepreneurs, because as you please appreciate that uh, the supply chains of the principles, global brands is very deeply embedded in China. There's a lot of inertia in shaking it up. So it's extremely important that we entrepreneurs deliver on what we have committed. And uh, I'm taking this liberty to even state that same applies to the government that what has been committed has to be executed seamlessly. And once we are through with it, I'm very sure it's going to be a multiplier effect. It's going to just go up, up, up. It's going to deepen, 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 and it's going to be designed. So I think we're in for good times, good for the industry. Thank you. Thank you so much. May I bring in uh, Arvind now? I think uh, Arvind, in uh, various forums, uh, uh, you know, your conversations, and I've heard some of them, You've always reiterated the fact that there is a huge gaping skill gap when it comes to the ICT industry. And with the technology dynamics playing out where there is that skill gap is sort of going to increase, uh, what are your views? How can this particular scheme help in bridging that gap? Actually, uh, skill is something, uh, as far as industry is concerned, so far, um, because I've also run factories, uh, most of our time, you know, like we just need people on yesterday basis. Manpower is required on urgent basis immediately. And we try to skill them, train them on the job. Now that is, uh, okay, to meet a requirement, yes, it is a good approach. But when it actually comes to running operations, it is much better to have pre-trained people who are skilled outside are actually given to the industry. Uh, they pick up the right kind of habits. I give this analogy that um, a lot of time you have seen people are driving, learning from their cousin or somebody, you know, like, and they run all the wrong things. And all their life they keep driving in a very erratic manner. Same way, you know, like, if you are not trained properly, then you always do the same mistake again and again, and industry has to pay a very heavy price for that. As such, what we have seen is uh, most of the workforce uh, even after training, I think they don't really come to the international level. Uh, so what we need to do is we have to first skill them and thankfully, you know, government has realized that in new educational policy 2020, from ninth standards, there is a focus on skill and also, you know, like at all levels, skilling is being given focus and we are very closely working with industry that, you know, like you give us your projections, you need not give us your demand, you know, no commitment, but just tell us that these are the requirements you will be seeing in the next six months or one year. We'll proactively train manpower and provide that. So there is a lot of work happening. Government is also contributing a lot. 
uh, industry is contributing through CSR funds and we are uh, training manpower. But I think the only thing what required is that uh, we being the central body will take the demand and understand the gap which is existing. And, uh, and the beauty is that on one end, as far as colleges and training institutes are concerned, they are all the time complaining that jobs are not industry mein jao, toh industry bolti hai, humko admi nahi milte hai. I think that is something which is unbelievable. So only thing probably that is there is, is no body to match, match making. So we at Telecom Sector Skill Council, we are trying to act as a bridge. We are trying to bridge that gap and we'll ensure that. Uh, and in last two years, we have done a lot of work around that. We have come out with a portal now, which is very convenient for workers, which is very convenient for industry to do it. So based on that, I think we'll be able to work a lot with the industry and make sure that they always get trained manpower in advance. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm turning to you, Jaydeep. Um, I think uh, from everything that the government, uh, you know, the intent of the government is uh, to support the uh, investment community or the players who are investing in the PLI scheme, how can the government support uh, this particular community in terms of uh, you know, uh, the various resources in terms of capital, uh, material, manpower, some thoughts there. So, uh, so good, uh, good afternoon and good evening to everyone here. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Hari Omurai has uh, rightly set the context for this uh, debate and discussion uh, with this Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, panel. From a timing perspective and a, and a strategic perspective, the, I think the, Clarion call given by the Honorable Prime Minister has been a, a, a very, uh, meaning it, it is expected uh, to get India into the manufacturing competitiveness of the uh, companies and, and, and countries in the East, which are the global companies. Now, for India to get into the global value chain, PLI, as uh, Mr. Rai mentioned, is is one of the catalyst. We need to bear in mind that this catalyst incentivizes output and it's not an input. So unless and until we have all the pillars of our resources that you refer to uh, in terms of uh, talent pool, in terms of uh, power, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, component system, unless those elements are in place, uh, we will start, uh, we will feel the challenges that probably uh, may not allow us to transcend and meet the full objective of uh, creating the Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, that we are planning to create. Now having said that, uh, the question is why, why ICT? Uh, ICT, when you look at India, India is adding close to 10 million uh, users to the internet uh, community on, on, a, on a every single day basis. Uh, we have been importing close to about uh, in excess of $400 billion of uh, components and, and finished products. So if we end up even spending half of that amount internally inside the country, that would allow the country to, to not only generate the employment, that is the need of the hour, it will contribute to the GDP, I think again, the, the point that you made, Mr. Wright. Uh, at the same time, it will allow the uh, MSME industry, and, and that, is the, that is the key, unless and until we have the pillars and that's the lower end of the manufacturing in place, our ability to incentivize and attract the bigger players will, will, will be challenged. Because uh, mind you, while the pandemic has created changes and you know, change made it favorable for India to look, we consider it as a one plus one destination beyond China or the East, uh, Eastern, East Asian economies. It is not something that, you know, is easy for, you know, just take a factory and, and move it to another location when the component system is not very strong. I mean, I'll, I'll give you the example of pros itself. We, we could not participate in the PLI scheme primarily because we could not meet the threshold limits of 10,000 crores, which was a minimum required for an MNC to be there. But that did not discourage us or that did not stop us from our commitment to the market, to the, to the country, because we believe in the, in, in the potential of India, we believe in the market, we've been here for the last uh, 15 years. And we continue to stay invested, and, and not only stay invested, 
we are planning to invest almost two times in the next two to three years than what we are currently uh, at this at this uh, at this forum. And I would like to make that make that uh, statement. So, on one side is is the opportunity uh, that has been created by the disruptions in, in the global supply chain, where India is being favorably considered as an alternative destination to uh, the other manufacturing countries. But at the same time, I think the challenge remains for India to make sure that the resources that are needed are, are made available in the right quantity at, at the right time. Ease of business do, uh, of, of doing business has uh, as, as been made clear is, is an important area that we need to continue to improve as a country. Thank you so much. Um, I think, Bhuvnesh, I'll turn to you. Um, I think uh, from everything that I've read on HFCL, you have invested in certain center of excellence um, sort of centers uh, where you are um, sort of investing in developing new age technologies. Um, if you were to look at the various schemes that uh, are coming under the PLI program, uh, what are some of those things that are both a boon as well as a challenge for you as you look into it from a manufacturing point of view? Thank you. Uh Thank you, everyone, uh, for having me here. And uh, let me try and uh, give you another uh, twist to the entire discussion that we are having. We are talking about, we started with uh, a goal of making us an Atman Nirmar Bharat. And uh, while the, uh, the overall intent is good, we started uh, funding companies or we started subsidizing or giving them some incentives to do production in India. Production does not mean we, we become Atmanirbhar. Atmanirbhar means we are self-reliant. Today, any production that we are doing, we are totally dependent on foreign technology. We are totally dependent on foreign semiconductors. We do not have these two in India. Government has realized this and moving forward, they are not only talking about PLI schemes as, as they started with. They are moving into DLI or DPLI schemes as well, where they are further in incentivizing the companies who are designing in India. And for the first time in this India Mobile Congress 2022, we can see that India is no longer a consumer country. We are now leading the technology, we are leading the innovations in the world. And companies like uh, us or any other Indian companies who are who are investing in research and development, who are investing in developing the technology, they need to be further, uh, they need to further come forward and make sure that we provide whatever it takes to do the manufacturing here in India. Which means we need to not only get into uh, just the production uh, uh, process, everything that is required to make the production successful, we also need to make sure that all the inputs which are coming into it, we are leading that also in the world. Technology, semiconductor is the next one. We are completely dependent, zero semiconductor production in India today. Unless we have control of that, I don't think we'll ever be become a real Atmanirbha. So that is something government has realized already. They are working on that. There, there have been schemes which are being rolled out. That is a long way to will take another maybe five years or even ten. I, I, I can't predict right now, but that's something that is bound to happen. Even before that, that is semiconductor part of it. But from a technology standpoint, even though we are, let's say, dependent on foreign companies to provide us semiconductors, even the designs are very limited in India. We need to start doing the technology. We have to start making equipment ourselves before we transfer it to production. And then only we will call, we will be able to call ourselves real art. Thank you. And you know, while you are at the uh, at the point of R and D and all of the new design um, uh, design uh, structures that you're creating, I also read that uh, both VVDN and HFCL collaborated in uh, building, designing, implementing some of these wireless technologies. Right? Um, would you be able to, Jeet, perhaps beginning with you and then over to Bhuvnesh, um, we if you can tell us um, how perhaps. Uh, the DLI scheme, uh, Bhuvnesh touched upon, uh, uh, touched upon it, how can these schemes really sort of uh, uh, set the stage for some high-tech international players uh, and industry players to come to India? Sure. Yeah. 
afternoon everybody so i think uh, no first things first it, it takes a lot of courage and conviction for a company to tr uh, to trust in a indian partner to develop a technology that is so crucial and that is so much part of their strategy it takes a lot of collaboration a uh, lot of hand holding uh, you know, it, it it wasn't easy uh, and uh, you know so uh, you know i have to say that most important part was really for hsl uh, to have the trust that they could really get these products uh, you know uh, designed collaboratively with the indian partner so so and this was this was a scratch start i think uh, you know i would leave the details to bhumesh uh, you know i wish uh, we could talk about you know everything that we went through and uh, the amount of pain they have you know we have given to them to really uh, make this happen wasn't easy at all uh, so so i think you know uh, bhunesh may talk a little bit more about that but it it's been very very super collaborative uh, from the designing point of view from manufacturing point of view um, and even breaking down the manufacturing components uh, localizing a lot of those components in india bhunesh and bhunesh basically on this experience do you think we are setting stage for some industry players international players to come down to india in terms of um, you know just the infrastructure and the experience that you've had uh, vividin has been an excellent partner and uh, we have been working for almost i've been uh, working with them even before jeet came on board i've been working with them for almost 7 years 6 years now and uh, i think hfcl and vividin together has done something which which is something unique for the first time when we started we did not have any ecosystem even to do small prototypes we had to we had to struggle a lot and we had to rely on some of the chinese manufacturers some of taiwanese manufacturers nothing wrong with that but it was a struggle to have that ecosystem in india and i am really proud to say that today we are other than semiconductor components we are not dependent on any other country we are doing all here in india within Uh, Delhi and Chennai itself. So we have been able to bring that ecosystem up. Many entrepreneurs came in. Many many new companies got set up, and all of them are flourishing today. And and we are really happy to see all that happening today. Now uh, talking about uh, uh, how we can take it further. Day day before yesterday, we launched a product which is for the first time in the world. an indian company has done and we are really proud of it the entire technology industry is looking at us as the front runners or the leaders of the technology and that is something that that is inspiring not just indian players but global players to to start looking at india as the technology uh, leader and uh, i think we are really proud of what we are doing thank you so much arvind if i can please jaydeep just like a, take a couple minutes to just uh, compliment absolutely that uh, nishal just mentioned uh, design led innovation i think is is really going to be the the game changer for the pli scheme which is already there pli is incentivizing manufacturing whereas design i mean without design manufacturing has its own limitations now we have a very good demographic dividend i think what we need to be doing is support that dividend in terms of and arvin did touch about the skill levels at the manufacturing level but i think we need to step a, le a level higher than that and try to in to get into the skill levels that are needed in terms of doing research and development in india and unless and until we are able to be having that talent and and having developed that talent we our ability to attract uh, investors in terms of doing the design work in india will be limited you will still be considered as a back office now we have some very good examples before us and in uh, especially the software industry it's what started as y2k apparently with the global outsourcing has developed and uh, the, the the software industry grew further from that but today most of our bigger software companies are at at, at product development so taking this example i think we need to nurture Uh, and have a system in place which will nurture the talent that is available and provide the uh, uh, r and d skill sets that uh, uh, investors need before they can be confident that you know it is it is uh, it is it is good for them to relocate their design capabilities from from other parts of the world into the country thank you so much jaydeep um arvind i'm turning to you um 
if you were to see there are the recently modified PLI scheme, right? It is uh, now inviting international players. In some sense, Intel uh, has uh, announced that it will start to sort of uh, have its production facility now in India just to take uh, advantage of uh, reduced, ex reduced sort of dependency on imports. Um, how would you think this uh, uh, particular modified scheme will play out in terms of just again uh, getting in, you know, foreign industry players back in India, uh, you know, increase the investor confidence and get uh, some global players to India? So any, uh, you know, high tech area, any development in high tech area, there are always uh, some simple steps. I think we have seen in this country also many times, there was a time that we were importing complete color TVs. Then we started uh, manufacturing color picture tube here. Then we started making glass shell here. And then, you know, ulti ultimately a stage came when we became the largest exporter of picture tube as well as glass in the world. So at that time, everybody imported technology. They brought investment from there. They bought experts from there. But gradually, you know, like we absorb it and we do it. Here also, I think in high tech area, one is, you know, like you start inventing your own wheel. It is better, you know, if something is available. They are also looking for globalization. So bring in such partners, uh, give them incentives, make Indian companies their partners, right? And then uh, make the real development. All international companies, like whether they are working in India or anywhere else, right? They always try to use 95 percent plus local people, even in the initial stages. I'm not saying that in the mature stage, of course, it is 100%. So that means it is always good for the country. So that is the process which should be following. So Intel example, definitely, you know, like Intel will be more than happy that, you know, India is a market for many, many, as we say that next century is ours. So that means they'll be investing in the next century by coming here. So we should incentivize all such companies and help. And uh, Indian business houses are all ready to partner with them. And, I think that is the way it should be growing. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we all touched upon semiconductors, uh, even in the opening address, Mr. Rai had um, sort of alluded to semiconductors, uh, shortage of it primarily now across the world. Do you think from uh, all of the schemes that are running, including you know uh, PLI, et cetera, is there some sense of uh, buoyancy in uh, sentiment whether we can actually produce and capture some of that production capacity uh, globally within India in terms of manufacturing semiconductors and perhaps Jeet first you and then I will turn to Mr. Uh, Atul if you can take that question as well. So uh, in, in terms of semiconductor shortage I think uh, you know, less we say you know, I think last last couple of years have been challenging to say the least. Yeah. Now what these schemes do is really create an environment. Uh, you know, uh, there have been few false starts in the past, I think, uh, but I think we have reached an inflection point where companies at least are very serious about it. And then, uh, you know, government has put money where the mouth is, and then the industry has also committed themselves. And few players have come up, and you know, uh, large ones for that matter. So, I think there is there is uh, if there was a better, you know, I think if, if there was a time. Uh, we could you know, really be serious about it. It is now. Uh, we are seeing a uh, lot of lot of talk about it, but but it is still still far out. I think this is how we see it. We are deep into it. Uh, it's it's going to take some time. Atul, the question of uh, supply chain challenges of semiconductors. Yeah, it was extremely challenging in the past two years, but lately the industry has uh, recalibrated. So it's no more that much of a challenge. And also the supply chain situation is significantly improved. So I don't think semiconductor is a challenge uh, in, in meeting the consumer demand. Now, on the government initiative and how semiconductor uh, will become a part of Indian manufacturing ecosystem, I think it's a journey. And it follows in the steps, which my esteemed fellow panelists have very, very beautifully elaborated. It starts with manufacturing. It goes into deepening of manufacturing, create, creation of local component ecosystem. Then comes design-led manufacturing. And I think semiconductor 
is an important element in the end of that road. So the government has rolled out an extremely attractive semiconductor policy. They've committed funding of approximately $10 billion. So that's, a, that's a lot of funding. We have seen some announcements, some large announcements. But uh, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but I just keep my fingers crossed that these actually get fructified on the ground. And as my fellow panelists just said, that it's going to take time. It's not going to happen very soon. It's going to take time. And also, are we going to be at cutting edge there? No, I think it's going to be 28 nanometers plus something like that. So I think it's going to take a lot of time. Thank you so much. And Jedi, turning to you, um, I think um, if you were to see uh, globally semiconductor uh, production uh, jurisdictions, Vietnam and certain countries still happen to be the lowest in terms of cost of production. Now, there is an opportunity there. Um, how do you see this uh, turning out in India? What can the government do in various schemes through PLI, DLI? How can we make ourselves more competitive uh, so that we are able to compete with our Asian peers? So, so first of all, let us uh, understand now and uh, about the semiconductor piece because that's very critical. Everybody is talking about semiconductor. Uh, the most critical thing uh, is for us to have our strategy completely right. Otherwise, you know, we will say, okay, we are going to do everything and in the bargain, we will not be able to do anything. Uh, in semiconductors specifically, there are three large components. One is on the SOC side, you know, the system on chip. And then it has to be assembled. Of course, uh, it has to be manufactured in the fab and then it has to be assembled and, and packaging, etc. is required. Uh, in application processor and also in the memory, a large part of the value is captured in the SOC side. And in that side where is human resources required, I think most of the semiconductors we are already doing in India through Indian manpowers. For example, Qualcomm, Intel, you know, uh, and many other companies have been doing, uh, their back offices have been here and in India, in Hyderabad, Qualcomm uh, has been designing, our engineers have been designing uh, uh, below 7 series onwards every single chip in India. MediaTek also when they decided to come in, into the mobile semiconductor, they bought uh, the uh, protocol side from the huge district and the MMI side from an Indian company and they amalgamated them together. And finally, they started manufacturing uh, the mobile chips. So India has huge power in the SOC side. And we have to harness this power. So first of all, we need to actually be globally competitive or we need to uh, actually excel on this side of the fabulous companies. Once we create the fabulous companies, then we can go to the, uh, the semiconductor side, which is a little longer journey, journey because in, in that journey we require a huge financial capital and huge technological capital. So for example, Korea has set aside $450 billion for that, out of which more than $150 billion uh, is, is by uh, Samsung themselves. Similarly, $250 billion is coming from the US, uh, 150 billion dollar coming from Europe. So when you see yourself in this entire, you know, world, then you find that 10 billion dollar is nothing. It could be a small step. It is a necessary and desired step because maybe 10 years later, we should be able to do something uh, which is required to be done on the fa uh, on the fab side. But uh, and and for the some strategic semiconductors we can do uh, here. But in terms of would we be globally competitive in the semiconductor uh, fabrications uh, in India in the short term? I think it is not. But the SOC and packaging is what India must aim for and uh, not only be globally competitive, we, we should lead uh, this segment of the world uh, globally. 
Jeet, if you can uh, add. I think, you know, uh, so, semiconductor is a long journey. I mean, the way we see it, it is 10 years out. Uh, 10 years, road, road, map, and there'll be multiple steps in it. Now, from an electronic manufacturing point of view, the way we see it, there's still, there are still lots and lots of immediate opportunities. I think we, what we do is we break down the bomb. And if I set aside, let's say, you know, if our bomb is 80%, uh, yeah, we, you know, 50%, let's say, which is, you know, class A is, is not touchable. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the rest of the 50% as well, uh, there's so much, so much can be done in that area, you know, whether it is M-bomb, whether it is connector, couplers, uh, you know, weak things, uh, thermals. These are all, all, you know, and all of these items, I think, uh, you know, industry has taken steps. So while we are on that journey, I think we will, and we are seeing immediate success coming in from that side. Uh, some discretes also, hopefully, you know, that doesn't require so much investment. So they, they, they are already there, you know, and we have taken some, you know, when we look at any electronic, you know, manufacturing ecosystem, we will start making the cells here, right? Memory, uh, is this work going on? So it's, it's not all doom and gloom, I would say. Uh, 10 years is, it is going to take 10 years or five years or seven years, you know. But there's a lot more to be still done in those five years, uh, so that at least you know we are able to get to a point where 70, 80 percent you know independence is there in that. Thank you so much. Um, before I come to the close of this panel, um, I'm going to open it up, maybe for uh, the panel, one big highlight that you'd like to share with us in respect to both the PLI scheme and what can the government do in order to make sure that um, this ICT sector really, really uh, finds its place in the sun as, and become what technology sector is to India, how can we be, be one of those uh, global lighthouses for telecom? Uh, Atul, starting with you. So undoubtedly, I think I would like to reiterate that uh, PLI scheme and now DLI scheme uh, particularly in the telecom devices sector, is, uh, is an immense platform for servicing the local demand on the telecom and electronic sector side. Uh, also, in various product categories, India and the various industries, various companies in India are going to be globally comparative. It's going to generate huge employment. It's going to be a huge foreign exchange earner. I firmly believe that the moment for, for our sector has arrived. And it's for us to deliver on it. It's for us to, to generate uh, huge dividends for the country uh, in this sector. From a uh, VVD point of view, we are beneficiaries of uh, four PLIs, I think. Uh, it, it's, it's been a turning point for us. Uh, what these uh, schemes, besides the uh, incentives that are there, they also create a huge uh, Visibility and environment, a very conducive environment. Uh, all of, you know, 60% of our business plus uh, businesses exports. Uh, customers talk a lot about it. Uh, it creates a lot of positive sentiment. And, and it has done all of that, right? Uh, what, what, what we would have, uh, you know, what we would desire more is, uh, uh, you know, uh, if, if the government, you know, government has supported everything that, you know, the industry asked for. Uh, there's one area that, uh, you know, if there's something that can be done is uh, the, the capital, the cost of capital in the country is still higher. It is, there's still, still a major handicap there. If, if that gap can be bridged, uh, there are some incentives available, uh, priority sector lending and all, but I think if, if the government can back it up with uh, uh, capital, uh, you know, and reduce that handicap, I think that would, would really, really help the industry. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, let me see how I see now, the government is the biggest company of a country, actually. And all the companies are beneath the government. And no company can evolve beyond government. When we realize that in our industry, we said that we need to work with the government very deeply. Because finally the competition is not between companies, it is between countries. And when we look at, for example, how China is subsidizing the cost of its infrastructure. So let's say, just to give you one example, uh, China give 
the entire factory uh, to a company free of cost for five years. And after that, you can acquire the factory. So imagine, uh, you know, you have invested hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in the factory infrastructure and you got it completely free of cost. And after five years, you are paying if you want to pay, otherwise you can take it on rent. So these inputs, China, and I'm just talk, I've just given an example of one of the inputs. China is subsidizing so many other inputs. So first of all, we understood as to how can they subsidize. This is a very important question. They could subsidize because they understand the fundamentals of economic multiplier. When one job is created of, let's say, a 20,000 rupees, it multiplies to about a lakh rupees, five times at least, you know, the multiplier is created. And on that, the government gets huge revenue. And because of that, the entire world is able to give subsidies and incentives. And the disabilities cannot go ever. Actually, we did not realize that, that we have to also do that. It cannot go ever as long as the governments are there to subsidize. We just need to understand that how can we be competitive. At this juncture, our per capita is only 17% of, uh, of the Chinese per capita. If we are at 17% of Chinese per capita, which means that the moment we are going to subsidize our inputs, we will be the most competitive globally. And this realization has happened. Now, after working with the government through a series of processes, what I found is that it is not the government which is the bottleneck, it is the industry which is the bottleneck. Because government has little exposure, industry has huge exposure, but industry cannot sit in their rooms and imagine something that government will be able to do. It is not possible. When industry is coming in front, making the government understand that this is the right thing to do and how it is going to impact the country's economy, jobs, etc. The government is actually looking at the leaders like that with binoculars. And if they are able to find, and the guys are not talking about this with crony capitalism mindset, the government is ready to follow everything, including what my friend talked about, the cost of capital. We are now looking at, as I've told you, that we are looking at the entire gamut of the competitiveness in which the cost of capital is a very important thing. And we are looking at it holistically, that how can we bring that cost of capital at 3.8% kind of a cost of capital which is there available in China, which is even now lower than US. So all these things are completely possible. We are now determined to make India globally competitive. So Atam Nirwar Bharat, right, that is something uh, we are at a stage where I think it is not a distant dream. Actually, we will be on especially electronics and other areas. Uh, reason being, one is, you know, like we as a country has the largest uh, demand side. Second, we have got the largest uh, young population. And we have seen it happening in uh, some of the industries, like IT is one example where I think so many youth are working and they are contributing to the world economy today. Same thing should happen and will be happening in telecom. Ultimately, the same thing should happen in manufacturing. So what we have realized in manufacturing, uh, maybe one skill, manufacturing skill is still not very aspirational. You know, like we have to make scaling aspirational for youth and for that work is happening. Second is that, you know, when we actually have well-trained youth, they will start giving much better productivity. Companies will be able to pay them much more. So it will have like a cyclic effect and more and more youth will be ultimately joining the manufacturing. So I personally believe that, you know, if companies and academia, you know, like if they work hand in hand, I think Atam Nirbha Bharat is something which will happen pretty soon in a big way. And also all this CSR fund, you know, 30,000 crore industry spending, government has allowed that these funds can be used for scaling purpose. If that fund starts coming to the scaling uh, institutions, then, you know, Definitely, we can skill manpower very well. They will ultimately come to the factories, contribute better for the productivity, and we'll become a nation which will be ultimately Atam Nirbhar. Thank you. Most of it uh, has already been said by uh, our colleagues here. And, uh, 
only point I, I want to add here is uh, government is doing its part. Government is uh, coming out with the schemes. Government is coming out with further incentivizing uh, on top of the schemes already. And I'm sure they will continue to do that. Now we as industry, now we have to start to deliver. We have to come up to speed to make sure that what government is doing, we are really taking it to a reality and not just leave it to a, to a concept. So I think the industry is geared up, we are all in it, and uh, we must start delivering. And that's how we will uh, reach our goal. Thank you. So when the Atmanirbhar Bharat scheme was actually announced by the Prime Minister, there was a lot of confusion as to whether the country was going back to its protectionist regime of the pre-90s. But when the PLI scheme was launched, the first PLI scheme was launched, I think, in April 2020, uh, and there was, uh, I think, a outlay of about 20,000 crores that was placed. Uh, and then there was mobile handset manufacturing, uh, white goods, uh, and medical uh, devices for the first participant. And then that was followed in November by an outlay of another 20,000 uh, crore rupees. I think that is when the industry took took this uh, took a serious notice of what is what is it that the government is trying to do in, in the creation of our But having said that, what we also need to take care of is while India is moving towards our Bharat, the rest of the uh, East Asian economies, which were which were the manufacturing so, so the manufacturing giants prior to India getting into the global value chain. They are also resetting their, their, their priorities. And India will do well in achieving its goal of Bharat, provided it, it makes sure that the supply constraints, whether it is in terms of resources, whether it is in terms of capital, whether it is in terms of power, land, uh, infrastructure, those, cap those things are not moving from the unprotected sectors to the, I mean the, to the PLI protected sectors. The expansion can only happen when there is a supply, uh, there is no supply constraint and resources are available in plenty for everybody to take advantage of this. Thank you so much, Jaydeep. And with that, I think we come to the close of this panel. Thank you all for your wonderful thoughts. I can only say that to me, Atmanirbhar Bharat is really speaks to the speaks to the building pride for this nation. And I think without um, our um, ICT sector, which really is the rails on which this entire dream will be built upon, uh, including building networks for the future. I think it's important that uh, we pay attention to the sector. And thank you so much for uh, being the stalwarts and driving this from the front. Uh, thank you all for your attention and your time. Uh, with that, we come to the close. <laughs>